Today we have some more actual history about the early days of Colorado during the 1860s. In a recent episode on this channel, we talked about the Hungate Massacre, where Arapaho and Cheyenne Indians killed the entire Hungate family in April of 1864. These were the beginning of Indian troubles in Colorado that would lead to the Battle of Sand Creek. However, before 1864, most of the conflicts in Colorado was between northern and southern sympathizers during the Civil War. There were several attempts by Confederate soldiers or sympathizers to capture Denver and its gold for the Confederacy. One of these men, who acted mainly to enrich himself and his gang, rather than to help the Confederacy, was a Texan named Jim Reynolds. In this episode, we are going to read about Reynolds' gang and their raids on stagecoaches and settlements in Colorado, and the action that the citizens of Colorado took to stop him. We will be reading from this book, True History of Some of the Pioneers of Colorado, by Luella Shaw. This book was published all the way back in 1909. After we read from this book, we will read from this article published in the March 1961 issue of the journal, Civil War History, written by Dwayne Allen Smith. This article will provide some additional details on Jim Reynolds and his gang. Jim Reynolds was a miner working at California Gulch, now Leadville. He got permission from the governor of Colorado to go down into Texas, his native state, and raise a regiment for the Union Army. When he started for Texas, people believed that he was honest in his object, but on his return they soon learned that his undertaking was not to aid the government, but to take advantage of it during its struggles and help himself. He left Texas with 22 men, but only had 8 men and 9 first-class horses with him on the Platte. The following narrative is only one of their numerous deeds. Nearly all of their attacks on the stagecoaches were along the Old Powell Road, this road wound around through timber and over hills, down on the Platte again. Being a well-concealed road, it afforded shelter along the sides of it for the outlaws to hide in, so that they could not be seen until they would spring out on their victims. This stage line was owned by Billy Berry, Ad Williamson, and Bob Spotswood. They ran the stage from Denver by Breckenridge, Fairplay, Alma, and then back into Denver. On one occasion, Reynolds and his gang held up the coach and robbed it of $18,000 in gold dust, the United States Mail and Express. Among the passengers was a young girl who had been working in the hotel at Fair Play and saved up $400 of her own money and had the same amount of her brother-in-law's money, which the robbers took from her. Mr. Dunbar, one of the passengers, as soon as he saw the robbers, got a bottle and played drunk. The bandit just supposed that he was a penniless drunkard and left him alone, so he saved all his money and had the most money of all the passengers. A band of Denver citizens formed a posse under George Shoup and went in pursuit of Reynolds and his gang. The outlaws were camped in the timber about ten miles down on the plat below South Park. They were always on the alert and expected to be chased, so they buried the money and other stolen valuables in a well-chosen spot near the road. It is said that even today there are people hunting along the old road for the buried fortune, while others say they know it was found shortly after the execution of Reynolds. The posse, which was familiar with the vicinity around the outlaw's camp, when once on their trail, was not long in finding them. Reynolds and his men, being overpowered and taken at a disadvantage, had no other means to save themselves except scatter and take their chances. Reynolds was shot through the arm, shattering it from the elbow to the wrist, but he and two others escaped. Four of their companions were taken prisoners while one was killed. A few days later, Reynolds was suffering so with his arm that he went into Pueblo for medical attention and gave himself up to the authorities there. He was taken to Denver and placed in jail with his four companions. It is said that while he was handcuffed and sitting on a box in front of his cell door, he sang in a clear, rich voice, and with such a depth of feeling, a beautiful hymn. Being in such contrast to the life he had been living, and a song the men seldom heard since leaving their old homes, it touched the hearts of all who heard it. The outlaws were given a trial under martial law and sentenced to be shot. Owing to the rebellious and antagonistic feeling among the people and the presence of rebels in Denver who would be expected to interfere, it was decided not to carry out the sentence in Denver. Therefore, Jim Reynolds and his four remaining comrades were confined in the jail during July and part of August. 
On August 19, 1864, when Company A of the 3rd Regiment of the Colorado Volunteers was ordered to Fort Lyons, they were also ordered to take five prisoners along and send them on to headquarters at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. The soldiers marched up Cherry Creek, conveying the bandits in the ambulance with Henry Crow. Assisted by an escort having charge of them, the second day out they were guarded by Sloan and an escort. Aston Shaw had been kept on guard and escort since the first day out. On the morning of the third day, he went to Captain Cree and said, How does it come, Captain, that I have to be with the prisoners all the time? Shaw, I want a man with them that will keep those fellows prisoners and not let them escape. Well, I will tell you this much, Cree, I am not going to hurt them every night. What will you do about it? Go kill the whole bunch. This is just what we want done. They were tried and sentenced to be shot. We dared not carry out the sentence in Denver, and sending them to Fort Leavenworth was just a bluff. We are to dispose of them on the road somewhere, unknown to anyone. I have sent out Crow and Sloan, but they have failed to carry out orders, so now I will turn them over to you. I will do it, Captain, if you let me pick my escort. Pick any man you want. Picking Ad Williamson, Adam Smith, A. Neeland, Oscar Packard, Isaac Beckman, and Frank Parts for his escort. Alston Shaw took charge of Jim Reynolds and his companions. The ambulance containing the condemned prisoners followed the regiment down Squirrel Creek Road. After traveling a few hours, Shaw noticed a little bluff that would conceal him from the regiment, so he ordered Williamson to drive the ambulance back to the bluff. When the team stopped, he ordered the shackled prisoners out. Then, turning to Reynolds, he said, Jim, you are supposed to be captain of this company. I have your obligations where you were sworn to stay together until your bones bleached on the prairie. That was our obligations. Jim, this is your finish. If you have anything or any word that you want sent to your people, give me their address and I will see that it is done. No, I do not want any of my people to know what became of me. Reynolds nor any of his companions would not give a word of information concerning his home or people. Jim, you have no show. Here is an order from the Commander-in-Chief of the Western Department stating that you have been tried by court-martial and sentenced to be shot. This is just what I expected, and I am ready. Would you rather be shot separate or altogether? You read our obligations where it said we would stick together until our bones bleached on the prairie, and that is the way I prefer to die. Shaw placed Reynolds in the center with two of his comrades on each side, then had the escort stand sixteen feet in front of them. Jim Reynolds knelt on his knees, pushed his hat back from his forehead, folded his arms across his breast, and said, I am ready, being game to the last. But one of his men began to cry and said, I never killed anybody. Shaw replied, Remember the story of Old Dog Trey. You were caught in bad company. Shaw loaded the guns, putting a blank cartridge in one so that the men could not tell whose bullets did the killing. He then ordered them all to fire at the same time on the man to the right. Reloading the guns, he ordered them to fire at the next. They repeated this until all the prisoners were killed. Just before the orders were carried out, one of the escort dropped his gun and began crying. Frank, what's wrong? Pick up your gun and hold yourself in readiness, commanded Shaw. To make sure that they were all dead, Ad Williamson shot each in the head with a big brass-mounted revolver. When the execution was over, Neelan, Smith, and Shaw took off the shackles and handcuffs, and one of them said, We will leave you free to carry out the last of your obligations, to stick together while your bones bleach on the prairie. The escort just let them lie as they fell, and turned on down the road to join the regiment. On the way down, they met Captain Cree, who demanded, Where are those prisoners, Shaw? We stopped down there in a hollow to dig some potatoes, and they got away in the brush, and we couldn't find them. Cree whirled his horse and started in pursuit of the escaping prisoners. After a time, he returned without them, and that night in camp he wrote a report according to Shaw's account of how the prisoners escaped, and sent it into Denver. The disappearance of Jim Reynolds and his gang was published in the Rocky Mountain News, the only newspaper in Colorado at that time, according to Captain Cree's report. The true statement of the execution was not made known for about 20 years afterward. The execution of these men was a hard task for Shaw and his escort to do, but it was orders from headquarters, and if they failed to carry them out before reaching Fort Lyons, they would have shared the same fate as the outlaws. So that's it for this story from Luella Shaw's 1909 book, True History of Some of the Pioneers of Colorado. 
We recently released a video for our Patreon and YouTube channel members about the Hungate Massacre. The man who led the assassination of Reynolds and his gang, Alston Shaw, was one of the men who found the mutilated body of Nathan Hungate. Shaw had tried to leave Colorado for Montana when martial law was declared, but his teams were taken from him for use in the army. So he joined the 1st Colorado Cavalry Regiment. To provide a broader scope on these events, I will now read from the article, The Confederate Cause in the Colorado Territory, published in the journal Civil War History in 1961, by Dwayne Allen Smith. Raids into Colorado by Confederates were a constant fear of the settlers and governments. Although there were many rumors, including the threat of the South unleashing Indians on the territory, only two recorded groups actually raided into Colorado, while a third attempted a foray. In August of 1862, a guerrilla band under a Captain Madison was reported harassing settlers near Fort Garlands. The forces contained 35 men, who claimed to belong to the Rebel Army of Texas. By the 18th, the company was supposed to have divided into squads which were prowling near the Raton Mountains. Later in the month, it was reputed that the group had departed. However, in September, a party of Rebel scouts hovering about Fort Lyons was said to be commanded by Madison. Thereafter, no further reports came of Madison's guerrillas. The best planned, organized, and by far the most ambitious of the three raids was led by one Charles Harrison, one of the most colorful figures in the early saga of Denver. Harrison, professional gambler, elegant dresser, and reported to be one of the deadliest gunfighters in the West, owned the famous Criterion Saloon in Denver. Charlie, with his gracious southern manners, cut quite a figure. He was forced to leave Denver shortly after the shooting of a Union soldier in August 1861. Moving into Missouri, he soon became one of the better guerrilla leaders in the border warfare. The news of December 16, 1862 noted that Charles Harrison of Criterion Saloon notoriety, instead of being captured as reported, is now with Quantrill's gang. Harrison fought in several campaigns and rose to the rank of colonel in the Confederate armies. By 1863, the South was badly in need of gold and men. A plan was devised by which a force would be sent to Colorado to capture its gold and recruit men for the army. As he was familiar with Colorado, Harrison is generally considered to have fathered the plan. The men selected to go with Harrison were all officers and would command the regiment of soldiers the Confederates hoped to raise in the territory. On May 14, 1863, Harrison led 19 volunteers into Kansas. Though well equipped, they were all dressed in civilian clothes. Three days later, they unexpectedly met a group of Osage Indians. The Osages were one of the few remaining Indian allies of the Union, and on occasion they served as Union scouts. A brief and stormy conference followed. A shot was fired and an Indian was killed. Harrison and his men pushed on, hoping to outdistance the Indians, but they were soon overtaken by a larger group of Osages. In the ensuing fight, all except two of the white men were killed. The two survivors made their way back to Confederate lines. The Indians willingly led Federal troops to the site of the battle, but the bodies had been mutilated beyond recognition. Yet from the papers the Indians had taken, it was obvious what the mission of the group had been. Perhaps the best known of the guerrilla raids into Colorado was that of 1864 by James Reynolds, who had been a miner in Colorado at the outbreak of war. The true exploits of his group are hard to determine because of conflicting stories concerning their activities. But it is established that in late July, after capturing two wagons on the Santa Fe Trail, Reynolds and his band of 22 men rode into southeastern Colorado. Reynolds and part of his followers galloped into South Park, where they plundered ranches, mines, and all other sources of wealth. They robbed one stagecoach from Buckskin Joe of about 4,000, and reputedly lifted 18,000 from another. The citizens of Denver were especially worried since, according to a report, Reynolds had boasted that before leaving the territory, he would treat Denver City as Quantrill had dealt with the town of Lawrence, Kansas. If Reynolds did make such a threat, he was never able to carry it out. State groups from the mining camps and Denver proper joined with a detachment of the 1st Colorado Cavalry in an intensive search for the guerrillas. Reynolds' camp was surprised, and five of the group, including Reynolds himself, were captured. The remainder fled from the territory. The five prisoners were taken to Denver and temporarily jailed. A few weeks later, the group started for Fort Lyons under heavy guard. The prisoners never reached their destination. 
What transpired on the trail still remains a mystery. Several versions of their fate were circulated. The story released to the press stated that the prisoners were shot while attempting to escape. In any event, with their removal went the last southern raid into the territory of Colorado. In the remaining months of the Civil War, the bitterness between northern and southern elements in the territory decreased because of a new threat common to both. Indians. This danger acted as a hammer in driving the two groups together to face new problems and forget old differences. From late 1864 on through 1865, the main occupation of the Federal and Colorado troops was in checking the Indian uprisings. Pro-Southern activity was a thing of the past. The Confederacy did not materially gain from its activities in and around Colorado. No large amounts of gold were shipped south. While the Southern Army gained some recruits, from the returning miners, the total number was too small to be of consequence. The only major attempt to secure the region as a southern territory, and thereby aid European recognition, ended with Sibley's defeat in New Mexico in 1862. Of the two recorded raids into the territory, Madison's is almost unknown, and Reynolds was more of a looting expedition than a military campaign. Neither aided the Confederacy to any degree. Harrison's proposed raid might have been of value to the South if its goals had been accomplished, but it collapsed in Kansas and never reached Colorado. The territory offered many opportunities to the Confederates, but owing to the varied reasons, they never were able to capitalize on them. In the war, Colorado's position, both political and geographical, was unique. Neither the slave question nor states' rights ever played a prominent part in the thinking of its people, and the territory was too far removed from even the Western theater of war to play a role in such campaigns as those for control of the Mississippi. Had those of southern leanings continued to flock into the region as they did in the early days of settlements, the Confederacy might have gained a foothold but by 1861 they were obviously in a minority. On the other hand, no great enthusiasm for the Union was in evidence. Lured by the sparkle of gold, only half of the miners eligible to vote bothered to do so in the election of 1860. They were content to dig in peace beside Northerners and Southerners, and at day's end they spent little time in reading or discussing the problems of Congress and the nation. The indifference of the people was in itself a tremendous handicap for avid Southern sympathizers to overcome. Yet by the time they attempted to penetrate the apathy, Governor Gilpin, his aides, and a strong territorial regiment had cemented federal power in strategic places. When A.G. Miller and his men left the region, and after the capture of McKee and his followers, all hopes for an active Southern campaign in Colorado ended. Strong-minded secessionists migrated southward throughout late 1861 and 1862. Those who remained were powerless to act. The closest Confederate force was 400 miles distant in Texas, and Federal garrisons at Forts Laramie, Lyons, Garland, and Union protected the major approaches to the area. In short, the Southerners tried valiantly to overcome many obstacles, but in the end, Federal numbers and power, and the lure of gold, proved too great. So that's it for this episode about Jim Reynolds and his gang. This was quite a turbulent time in the history of Colorado and for the country. This article notes that both slavery and states' rights were not important issues to most of the people in Colorado. Instead, there were people who were sympathetic to either side, and there were both outlaws and Indian tribes who tried to take advantage of this isolated region. In a future episode here on this channel, we will hear about yet another threat to the citizens of Colorado, this time from a Mexican desperado hiding in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Alston Shaw was part of the group who would go in search of this desperado. This channel is called Unworthy History because we talk about actual history that is now deemed unworthy to present on so-called history channels on TV. Rather than cover the history of swamp people, pawn shops, aliens, skinwalkers, or toys, we try to cover actual history on this channel that you might find in a history class or in a history book. If you'd like to support the mission of Unworthy History, then consider joining our Patreon page or becoming a YouTube channel member. Your contribution towards keeping actual history alive will be recognized at the end of each episode, and you will also have access to special members-only videos. This recent video tells more about the life of Alston Shaw, including his role in finding Nathan Hungate's body in April of 1864. 
So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.